Welcome to The Craft. I'm your host, Mae Globus. This podcast is a collection of intimate conversations on artistry, mastery, and life with talented, passionately curious creatives and entrepreneurs. Most are dear friends, some are those I've admired from afar. I hope you enjoy these conversations, this exploration of the humanity that connects all of us as much as I do having them. Thank you for being here and for listening. This episode is sponsored by Happy Fox Health, a natural supplement brand focused on sea moss, a marine algae that has 92 out of 102 essential nutrients that your body needs to thrive and regenerate. I've used a number of their products and found it's really given me clarity of mind. Visit happyfoxhealth.com and use promo code THECRAFT for an exclusive 15 to 20% discount off your first product purchase. There's a wonderful gentleness to Richard Smart, the owner of EC Rare Books, a subterranean shop in Gastown, full of first edition books and titles. A third generation book restorer, he and his late grandfather and late father are well known and trusted in the large international antiquarian book world as the best at their craft. He grew up in London, England, the grandson of Charles Smart, who became a bookbinder in the 1930s, mostly out of necessity. His father, John, joined the family business as a young man, taking it over after Charles became ill. Richard, who loved motorcycles and building things with his hands growing up, also eventually learned the art of restoring books, coming into the company and relocating with it from the city to a smaller, more affordable town outside of London. With a desire to carve his own path, Richard attempted to move his family to Melbourne, Australia, but when that fell through, he found himself in Canada instead. In this conversation, we discuss how joining the family business wasn't his initial dream and what he really wanted to do how he came to enjoy his craft in more recent years, now that he's added a bookshop to the restoration studio, the things he must consider from a material and chemical standpoint when restoring a book, the joy it brings him when the younger generation wanders into his shop and marvels at what's in there, the life lessons he's learned from his late father, what he wants for his daughter, a talented ballerina currently dancing abroad, and much more. Please enjoy this fascinating conversation with a true guardian of history, the kind and humble Richard Smart. Richard Smart, welcome to The Craft. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. Yeah, I'm very excited to have you on. Um, You and I only met probably two months ago, I think. And the reason why we met is because you have a wonderful shop called EC Rare Books, which is subterranean. It's underneath Revolver in Gastown. And my friend Pearl and I, Pearl has been, she's a longtime friend of mine, but she's also been a guest on the show. We passed by the shop and I saw your signage. This was before you had the sandwich sign. Right. And I thought, what is, we were both like, what, what is this place? And we wandered in and you were there. And it is a book that has like first editions. It has all these antique books. And you are a third generation book restorer and conservator is that what they call it uh mostly book restorer but book restorer, uh, yes yeah. both both work yeah, yeah yeah i think it's so incredible and you spent so much time with us explaining and pulling out books from the safe and i think you pulled out a, a margaret atwood and there was a letter in there that oh she had uh, written. gone with the wind yes um margaret mitchell margaret mitchell yeah. yes that's right yes. um and then you also pulled out a medical textbook from the 1800s. Yes, so that was um, the first book on vaccines by Edward Jenner, um, a working copy, and it actually has his initials in it, mm-hmm. um, and all the plates showing the uh, cowpox and smallpox and the vaccination. Yes, and there was also a piece of uh, art, like a painting, too, that you showed us, and it was it looked like people with pig's heads on them or animal heads. Do you remember that? Probably, but and you're I can't like, remember oh, that. you're like they're anti-vaxxers even back in the oh, day. Oh yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. So it was um, it was a satirical plate that was done in the 1800s um, by the Anti-Vaccine Society, and they were saying that if Edward Jenner gave them the cowpox vaccine to prevent smallpox, or for the cure of smallpox, they would grow cows out of parts of their body. That's right. That's yes, right. We yes, had a good laugh. Yes. We were we were laughing that the divide with vaccines went 
way back. Yes, yes, yeah. and, and, and nothing has really changed. <laughs> nothing has Someone changed. Someone suggested the other day it should be redrawn with just 5G network coming out instead of uh, <laughs> cow's heads. <laughs> that would be incredible. That would yeah. definitely be of the times. Yeah. So let's go way back. You are from the UK and you grew up in England. Yeah, London, England. Yes. Tell me tell me about your childhood a little. Um, yeah, grew up in London, England, um, South East London, Bromley. Uh, my father had his workshop in Lewisham, which is right on the um, edge of L London, really, just before Towbridge from the south side. And uh, yeah, it was uh, a normal childhood, family, two brothers. Um, a lot of my time even then was spent leaving school, getting on a bus and going to my dad's workshop, hanging out there uh, until he was finished for the day and then we'd go home. Mm. What were you like? As a child? Yeah. Um, mischievous. Yeah, I was, uh, his workshop was on this, what they call a muse. So it's like an alleyway. And I was always, even at 10, 11 years old, trying to ride motorcycles up and down it. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, he was building a Land Rover and I would take that out and ride that up and down there. So I got to know all the mechanics in the area. So I was, yeah, a busy kid. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He rebuilt a Land Rover. Yes, yes. Wow. It's something I ended up doing as well later on. So. Oh, no yeah, way. Yeah, Do yeah. you still have it? No, no. Oh, no. but that's too bad. I hope it you have a picture. Too bad. <laughs> I, do. I need to see one. I yeah. need to see one. I wish I'd kept all of them. They're worth a fortune now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, um, and your grandfather was the one who started the book bindery. Yes, um, he did his apprenticeship, um, I think it was 1912, 1913, as a vellum binder as a small boy. And he then went on to work for other major book binders in London, uh, Zangolskin, Sutcliffe, Sainstoffs. Um, my grandmother worked for Bainton Reviews as a paper restorer and then I think just prior to the Second World War, he decided to set up on his own. Um, then the war happened, and then he came back and carried on mm -hmm. with his own workshop working for the London book trade. Right, and your your grandfather's name is Charles. Charles Edward, yeah. Right, Charles Edward, and then your father was John Smart. Yeah. And then he took over. He took business. over in 1961 when my grandfather passed away. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. And you worked alongside your dad for Decades. Um, yeah, probably about 15 years. Wow, yes. okay. Yeah. Okay. I thought it was longer than that for, for some reason. Do I look yeah. that much older? <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought maybe since you were you were very, very young working alongside Well, I guess I, it, yeah. I, I was taking it from the point that uh, where I actually started working for him, I guess. But I yes. worked alongside him. Same as my daughter was doing gold tooling on books at the age of seven. Mm. You know, so yes, I, I had done, I've been there all my life. Right, working. right. And yeah. so the company was in London, yeah. but then it eventually moved to a village outside of London. Yes. Yeah, yeah. you needed bigger space. and I th it, was a, it was during the um, early 80s, London was becoming really, really expensive. Um, my mother had got a job teaching. Uh, she was a high school teacher. So my father decided that it was good to move us out to the country. So we moved... Um, kind of 80 miles up the highway mm -hmm. to a country area and uh how did you like that from I city to it. country a life changed in a big way for me um I went from motorcycles and uh the cars and things like that to riding horses and uh hunting eventing um mm -hmm. show jumping oh no way yeah. oh we never got into yeah. to that in so, our conversations yeah. so um, competitively Competitively, yeah. Oh, were you quite good? I was okay. Um, the restriction with, with horse riding is you need a really good horse, and they're really expensive. Right. And so we, we didn't have the funds to do that. So Right. Uh, just, do you still love horses now, and do you spend time around them? Um, if I can. The last time I rode was a few years ago um, on Bowen Island at a friend's place. Mm. Um, but I, I would love to. Yeah. Um, but it's... It's hard around here, unless right. you live out in the country. Yeah, or if you're near the Southlands, actually. Yes. Yeah, yes. which is, it's beautiful there. Yes. The last guest that came in into record is, is a dear friend of mine, and she's been a long-time equestrian, too. And she was saying that she's she's loved horses since she was a, a little girl, and she finds them to be very spiritual animals. Right. Yeah. 
there's just something about them. Do you find the same? Um, I find them more spirited. Spirited. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Yes, I like the, the more masculine yeah. side of, yeah. of yeah. horses. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. So tell me about um, when you entered the business finally and the reasons why you decided to join the family business. The reasons why. There was no particular reason why. Um, I really wanted to go into agriculture, wanted to ride horses. That's what I wanted to do. Um, my father actually had a quite a serious car accident uh, and can't remember what year it was, but mid eighties and uh, he couldn't drive for a while and he found work quite hard. So I just started, I was in the middle of, th of or I had a gap where I wasn't doing things. So I um, started helping him out mm. and I guess I stayed helping him out until I went off on my own. So, right, yeah. right. It seems um, that you were talking about, which I didn't know about, the motorcycles and the restoring cars, and also with what you do now, it's so tactile, like using your hands. So yeah. this must be, is this a natural talent for you, like the use of your hands and crafting and building? It is, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it was, and, and I think it follows in the family, the one reason my father ended up going in with um, his father and he took over was because his two brothers, they were intelligent, they both went off to Naval College and someone needed to fund putting them through Naval College. So my dad was the obvious choice to work with my with his father. Um, and again, my two brothers both had the smarts mm -hmm. and uh, brains to go off and do other things. Um, I was just a natural choice to stay and run the business. Right, right. And tell me, because I know that you worked alongside your father for many years, um, what was he like and, and what was it like working with him? It was difficult. Um, it was uh, it was hard. It was difficult. I, th I think one of the things that kept me there, not so much was my father, was the customers. Um, very early on, one, one customer that we had in London who also knew my grandfather gave me a box of books and said, I want you to work on these restoring them. And any that I think are good enough, I'll pay for. And if, if they're not, then I won't. Um, so that was that became a drive for me to do that and, and keep and get more involved. The one thing with my father was that I really didn't like at the time was the fact that he would never say that I had done a good job. He was um, not totally critical and he wouldn't say I'd done a bad job. He, there was just no affirmation about the fact that I was on the right path or, or doing a good job which long-term now, looking back many years later, um, I realized that was, for me, a good thing. It meant that I kept driving forward for perfection in what I'm doing. Um, and he had these silly little say sayings like, um, the, the one day that you do perfect something, you might as well give up. Mm. And it was just crazy things like that. Um, but that, that just became a fuel for me to keep going and trying to be better and better. So I was kind of fighting his his demons as well as mine. Mm, really interesting. Because yeah, his father probably did the same to him. Exactly. That that quote that you just that the ism your that your your father told you it reminds me a lot of the Japanese culture a little bit where you can never you know all of the masters of the crafts out there there's there's never they try to perfect everything but they also know that there's never achieving right. it yes yeah yes. yeah and that's kind of yeah. the mastery in it is that you never actually do achieve it yeah yeah, yeah. Mm. which i think is a it, it's a good thing you know it's otherwise you can't break barriers you can't uh if you never if you know there's never an uh, an end result that's absolute perfection then you keep driving towards that but if you convince yourself that perfection is earlier than it should be then you stop mm. Yeah, I really like that perspective a lot. Yeah, the constant improving of life is is yeah. what makes life richer. I feel like yes, indeed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you did try to to break the mold a little bit because you did want to sort of move away, and so you tried for Canada, but Melbourne first, no? Yes, I I tried to go to Melbourne first. Um, there were a group of antiquarian bookshops that we already did work for, and they wanted me to go and set up a bindery there. Um, it just didn't work out. The paperwork just didn't fall in the right place, although we did our best but from both sides of the 
the pond um, mm -hmm. to work it out. But uh, so ended up in Vancouver. Yes. And did you love it when you got here? Yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, there was a lot of excitement about um, moving to a different country with a couple of suitcases and, you know, setting up your own workshop and your own bookshop and, and making things work. Yeah. A new adventure. Yeah. I'd love to get into the process of things. So I know in the first couple of conversations we had, um, you always said the word bench. And I was like, what does that mean? So bench <laughs> means when you're actually like doing the, the work. The bench is, the, is basically the table I work on. So oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. On the bench. Yeah. Got yeah. it. Most of the grindstone on, working on the bench. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I know that when we had come into the shop, you had shown us a couple of very, very cool things. Um, you had shown us like four edge painting, yes. uh, which I'd love for you to explain because it's, and also I'd love for people to see this. So please go visit Richard if you get a <laughs> chance to see it. Four edge painting, it's um, when you fan the edges, it's very difficult to describe, but if you fan the edges of a page out at an angle um, and clamp it in that position, then they would do a watercolor of a scenery or something normally relating to the book, like po something to do with the poetry in the book. Very popular during the 1800s, late 18, early 1900s. Um, and then when the book is closed, the, the painting disappears and you're just left with the gold edge that you would normally see on an antique book. It's really so it's, it's completely cool. hidden. And, it's and, completely... and it, again, it's, um, I think it's very telling of the time that uh, people weren't seeking approval in the same way or, or notice of look what I have done kind of thing because very few of them were signed. Uh, they were hidden artwork, uh, whereas now we, we like to, even the smallest thing, have it on a wall or show it off. Mm. So it's actually really nice that it's it's still a hidden thing. Right, right, a hidden gem. Yeah. And we're not talking about a, a simple painting. These are very intricate. They are, yes. Yeah, yes. which is it's so, so beautiful. So I love, so there is the restoration of books and then there is the conservation of books. So for the people who don't understand this at all, could you talk about what each of that means? A little bit. Um, there's, there's a constant argument over conservation and restoration. So I can't speak too much on the conservation side of things. Um, conserving something is basically trying to stabilize it, make sure it lasts longer, and keep it in that condition for as long as possible. Whereas restoration, I will try and restore something to its original um, state, making it look as old as it should be of its time, instead of making it look new. So it, it still looks contemporary, it looks old, but it's actually being restored to its original state. Right. So using the same original methods, um, if I have to match up an old piece of paper, I will match up an old piece of paper, whereas a conservator will match up a, a new piece of paper even if it doesn't match because that's acid-free and beneficial to the longevity of the book. Mm. Right, right. There's such an art and science to what you do. The art of a book, I think, is pretty self-explanatory, but the science of it is when you're doing your work, you actually have to understand the chemicals and the materials and how they would react together. That's it's really scientific, actually. It, yes, it is, yes. Yeah. Um, but it, that's one of the things that I don't realize how scientific it, it is um, because I came into it through the family, so I didn't have to actually go and learn about the whys... The, the, the you know the the fours and against of doing something so much as just get on and do the job because this is the way we do it right right it's almost like um when i think of indigenous cultures and just the storytelling that they pass along mm -hmm. there's no real like uh, not that i know but it's but uh, um but seemingly it's just people just pass it down yeah. and it's very it's very natural that everyone should know how to, yeah. to do that. Yeah, and we believe those before us and we keep doing yes, it. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. And I love too when you walk into your shop, you have all of these tools from a long, long ago. And I think you told me that your dad said, well, if you're going to restore a book from the 1700s, you might as well be using the, you need to be using, using the, the tools. Tool. Yes. Right. And so a lot of those tools are your, your grandfather's too, right? Some of my grandfather's, some of my father's, um, some are ones that I've had made deliberately with the patterns 
um, but they still don't, the newer ones, um, I say new, 30 years old still, they don't give the same patina to the job I'm doing as an old tool will. Mm -hmm. I'm so curious because I have always really loved books ever since I was a kid and, and reading. And even to this day, I don't use a Kindle. I will always buy um, like a, a, a book book to read. And uh, I feel like the book of, of like I mean, the world of antiquated books is much larger than I, I think. Like you guys are pretty well known internationally, nationally amongst um, booksellers and, and in the trade. Yes. Um, for those who are uninitiated, how big is this this world of antiquated books? Oh, it, it's large. It, it's there, there's many, there's hundreds of probably thousands of antiquarian book dealers. Um, we do have antiquarian book fairs all around the world. Um, there's some very large specific book fairs like London, New York, which is coming up in April, um, California. There was one used to be one in Hong Kong. I don't think they have that at the moment. Um, Dubai. So it, it is there. There are large antiquarian book fairs where you get together and we trade again amongst ourselves a little bit, but also we're there for the collectors. Right. It's such a subculture. Yeah. And you forget too that all of the really, really old books, like, of course, the pages are, are paper, but it's not like our books these days, which, you know, it's like that, the hardback or, or whatever, just like the flimsy cardboard. But these were made of leather and cloth and the bindings were sewn sometimes yes. or stitched. The stitched yeah. yeah, it's really beautiful. And so um, there must be so the what in terms of people who are like you, are, are you kind of a very small group of people who are restoring books or are people specialized like someone who is doing bindings um, with stitching like that's all they do it used to be like that with some of the larger bindries that were still specialized um, in London you would have a department that did uh, the sewing you would have a department that did the forwarding of a book so putting the binding on and then you would have the finishing department that did the gold tooling so it, it used to be but now it's very much a, gone to a small craft where you do everything yourself. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, there's not many people, but there's a lot of people that do it, to my words carefully, as a hobby. Um, as far as doing it professionally, there, there are very few. Um, and doing it at, the, at a level where you're working with some of the top antiquarian book dealers around the world, there's even less. Mm. Um, but it's also very difficult to get, it's easy to get your name known as far as those that would like to, I guess for me it's easy because there's so many generations of antiquary book dealers that have known my grandfather, my father and me. Um, but there, there, is, there was one dealer that said to me a while ago, he's like, you're the trade's best kept secret. And basically what he's saying is, you do a really good job for me and I'm not going to tell anyone else. No. <laughs> So not getting the word out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. Um, but I am known through those same channels anyway, but it was just a weird compliment that he said. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Backhanded compliment. Exactly. And those, you know, sometimes you'll put those in your pocket. That's yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if someone came to you with a book that needed restoring, for those who are really interested in process, mm -hmm. what does your, your process look like? Uh, much of it depends on the book. Um, most books from the period that I tend to work with will have problems, for example, the, the, the joint where the, the point where the board of the book, the cover of the book meets the spine, that will break. Um, so if it is a fine binding, then I would need to repair those, the joints or re-repair to make it uh, complete again. Um, sometimes the binding has been completely destroyed, so I then rebind it in the same style, same leather to, pe to the period that it should be. Mm. Um, but it is, it's very individual. Right, yeah. I guess there's no blanket. It's like a, we were, you and I were talking about how all the books, they have their own personality yes. and energy. So you're really kind of working with what you, yes, what you, yes. you have. Yeah. You also, I remember saying, uh, you said to me that you could get a book and know that your father has worked on it. That's really interesting. Yeah. I knew you were going to ask that one. Actually, yeah. I just it came right into my head as I was saying that. So, yes, I've had I've certainly had books through that um, 
for one reason or another that I recognized the repair work that had been done already. And maybe he had repaired a front joint on a book and now the back joint and the back cover has come loose. So I'm doing that. So I'm recognizing, I recognize his work mm. for sure. And, and the, the other thing with that, um, and, and going back a little bit to the growing up working with my father, because this has just come to mind again with your question on that, is that um, I spent many years just watching him work without actually even doing the work myself. Or when I was learning to do the work, I would watch him work. And I guess the, mo the point that I was closest watching was when I actually started working with him properly in the 80s. And he would have been probably about my age now. Well, so my father passed away May last year. And one evening I was just late, just working away, and I realized I was no longer looking at my hands. I was looking at his hands working. Wow. And I think that's because my, ha my hands are now look just like his did at that age. And it was kind of, it was just a really weird thing. So, mm. so the, the, the craft has now taken on a different meaning. I'm now working weirdly enough with his hands now instead right. of mine. So, yeah. Wow. Wow. It's, how do you feel when you say that? Um, I, I actually feel okay. I feel, I feel, um, I feel kind of happy that I had that realization mm. instead of letting it pass by. Mm. Because I'm normally the kind of person that lets that kind of stuff just pass by and, and don't acknowledge it. I'm the last person in the world to acknowledge things like that. So it, it is actually kind of nice that I could sit back and acknowledge it. Mm. But I guess I had no option. I was just looking at my dad's hands working. And maybe just perhaps appreciating the things His that, craft and his yeah. work and what he's done, yeah. Yeah, because I, I do remember asking you the first day, the first time I met you, uh, do you love what you do? And you had said to me, at the moment I felt so surprised when I, I, I heard it, but I mean, in getting to know you a little bit more, I understand there's so many more layers, but you had said you just recently started to enjoy what you do. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of it. Mm, was that realization? Yeah. Yeah, oh, that's really, really beautiful. Um, the last time I came to see you, I was so happy to see that, A, you had a sandwich board, and so people <laughs> knew your shop was there. But I saw so many young people come down and wander in from the street. Yes. And I know that turning your workspace, like moving into Gastown first from North Van, um, allowed you to open up a shop as well. So it wasn't just your studio yeah. to restore, but it's now a place where people can come and spend time. Um, and you said you loved seeing the younger generation come in. Tell me more about that and why you love when people come in to see these books. Um, I, th I think seeing the younger people, seeing anyone come in and asking questions about the books has, has also led a new dimension to me just being stuck behind the bench working. I now see, I see the enthusiasm from a lot more people than just my customer. Um, the one thing I am really surprised about is the young people that are that are coming in and asking about poetry and asking about different authors and and they're not asking about modern stuff. They're asking about some of the old things, the Shakespeare's, the Tennyson's, the, um, th those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And I and I I don't know whether it's true or not, but I I feel that um, they've heard their parents talk about their grandparents' books. But because we live in a city that's, um, I guess, very um, transient, so things have been packed away. Things have, have um, or even, not even made it here from their family home. So there's, been, there's a lot of talk about, oh, well, my dad used to have a library, or my grandfather used to have a library, um, but they've never seen it. And now they're walking into a place where they're feeling like this is what they should have seen in their life, but they never have. Mm. There's the Downton Abbey, there's the, the Peaky Blinders, there's, there's those things that are on TV now that are showing that period of time where there, were, where there was this ornate library with fine bindings and poetry and things, and, but they've never had um, an association with it. Mm. So they're walking into a bookshop and their eyes just 
widen and you someone walked in the other day and you could actually see even with a mask on the grin coming out of the side of the mask to their ears and I'm like you're smiling under that like, I can't believe it that's so wonderful yeah I, the last time I was in there, there was a girl who um, was reading Shakespeare. Yes. Well, she came back because she she couldn't afford the book, yeah, right? So but she, she came asked... back and she sat for hours and what and read. Really? The whole thing. How long was she there for? Because she was still there when I left. Oh, I think she was there for about four or five hours. Wow. Just yeah. Oh, that's so lovely. Yeah. Well, if anyone needs a reading nook, you know, uh, know yeah. where to go oh, again. Visit Richard. Yeah, and I have another old, uh, older lady that. Um, has a collection of books. They're, they're nothing special, but they are her dear books, mm. and she loves them. And she's read them all, and she'll come in and she'll pick up a book, and uh, you know, just a twenty-dollar book or something that's not in great condition. She'll take it home, she'll read it, she'll bring it back, and then she'll bring a couple of hers with it. Oh wow! For me to put in a bookshop, and it's just amazing. It's you know? so sweet. Yeah, yeah. It reminds me of those little mini libraries in some of the communities uh, I, where yeah. you can just you know, take a book take but, a book, leave, leave, but one. leave one behind. I think that's so, so wonderful. You should start uh, um, having like a teapot for, for people to come in and have tea and read books. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> the next evolution of the shop. Yeah. So I wanted to know where you think the future of what you do and your craft is going. Um, because are there young people who are interested in picking up this craft? What's going to happen post you and all other restorers? There are there are people that are interested in it. Um, I don't know the future. I don't know where it's going to go. I, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of tricks of the trade, for example, that have been never been written down that have, have been lost. And going back to my father never saying I did a good job, there's a lot of people that won't tolerate the fact that uh, it takes time to learn something. And and they'll have a go at a certain process and don't get a result within a day, and then they don't want to carry on. They, they, there's very few people I'm finding that are willing to actually put in that seven years before they see a result come through. Mm. Um, which is why apprenticeships don't really work anymore. Right. I was just going to say the word apprentice. Yeah. Like that's yeah. That's what that is. That's yeah, seven years, is. right? Yeah. You're you're toiling and probably not getting paid very much to, to yeah. do it. And that's not. That's just not. That doesn't work in today's world. So. Mm. Do you feel like there are any solutions for that? You know, in in the future, to make sure that there are people who are continuing to conserve and and restore and and won't be relegated to machines which i sure can't do the job um i don't know i can't answer that really i think uh, more and more books are just going to go into institutions and get um hidden away mm. um, without having been worked on and uh and, yeah, and that's I, I, I think be. that's just where it'll be yeah mm. Well, that's why it's important to have shops like yours Thank and you. people carrying them on. Um, do you miss the UK? Do I miss the UK? Um, I like to go back and visit now and again, not too often. Um, I don't think I miss it. Mm. Yeah, this became your home. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. I'm wondering when we were talking about about books and you were saying that you know, you work with each one individually. Was there ever a project that came through that you felt especially connected to? Yes, I guess. Um, I did a, a George Binding recently, um, and it was uh, it was an illuminated manuscript that would have, that was done in the early nineteen hundreds, and some of those fine illuminated manuscripts by this one artist who was the brother of a binder, um, Sangorski and Sutcliffe, who I'd mentioned earlier. And it never got put into the binding that it should have been in. So I ended up putting it into a jeweled binding. And the connection I found with that was one that my grandfather had worked for that company <clears throat> during the time that those bindings were being done. And also just trying to take myself back and work as a bookbinder of that time Mm. Um, creating something that was done then using different skills that I wouldn't normally use on a day-to-day -day basis. So I, I think that uh, there was a connection with that. Um, mm -hmm. 
I'm not entirely sure why I embedded myself so deeply in it, but I did. <laughs> yeah, it was just a feeling. Yeah. I remember saying to you when I first met you, do you realize you're a guardian of history? <laughs> <laughs> and I think that is so, so true that, that you are a guardian of history. And do you feel that way upon reflection? A little bit. Um, it, it's sometimes very difficult to, and again, because I didn't come into this through a passion. I came into this through a job. So for me, I think that um, I miss out on a lot of the fact that um, I am that guardian of history because of, of a passion, whereas it becomes I'm just redo I'm doing something for a job. Um, most of the people I work for are, are antiquarian book dealers, so it's, it's stuff that's going out for sale rather than going into an institution. I think if I was working more for institutions, I'd feel more like a guardian of history. Mm. Oh, I still think you are, though, <laughs> even if they're being sold. I mean, right. that history is still being circul circulated. So it is, yes. And, and actually out in the world, which is kind of beautiful is and not, yes. not behind a, yeah. a, a glass. So, yeah. yeah, it's allowed to breathe a little bit. Yes. And I think books should be carried on being owned by people, too. Right, right. I remember telling you that um, for a while I used to love going into bookstores and um, like used bookstores and seeing if I could. Um, if I opened the cover, if there was a letter or a note from someone. Right. And I always found that so beautiful when I would find one. Yeah. Just like a little, it's like a, just a note of care. Yeah. There's quite you often know? lots of things that are, that are found in books that are, are quite amazing. Mm. Uh, the most common, of course, is a pressed flower. Right. Um, which, of course, if it's been there long enough, leaves an image on the page itself, which looks quite amazing. Mm. Uh, but yeah, there's lots of little notes in books you find. Uh, there was a book I opened the other day, and there was two little paper uh, cutouts. It seemed like, like it was from a newspaper, but very early on, and they were both recipes for hangovers. <laughs> and I'm like, that's appropriate. <laughs> You're like, I'll be taking a yeah, picture I'll of these. I'll be taking these. <laughs> just, oh, I love just pasted that. in the front of the book. It was like, it's mm -hmm. amazing. <laughs> just little moments and memories yeah. I, I feel like yeah. your da your uh, your daughter Caitlin is very talented as well like in in this creative realm she's a ballet dancer very talented um, she was accepted into a pretty prestigious school yes. in Moscow yes she's a chip off the old block isn't she she's a hard worker she is a hard worker yes yes um, again she's I, I, I haven't been like my father um, so hard she has had a lot of encouragement, but she's also been brought up very realistic in, in what she should be, her, her goals, what they should be, and um, where to go with that as far as letting her drive again for perfection. Um, and she's, the, I, the, I think the most important thing about her are two things. She's very coachable and she's very hardworking. So it doesn't matter, it didn't really matter what her talent was in the beginning. It was the fact that she was coachable and hardworking. So that then creates the talent. Right. If, if it's naturally there, which it obviously was, but. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's that's what they say. You know, someone, when people say to others like, oh, you're just so lucky. Yeah. People are like, that's not it. No, you know, luck not. is actually a lot of hard work. Yes. And just the right timing. So yeah. I mean, I could have put her on a pedal stool right from the beginning because she is amazing. But that wouldn't, I feel that wouldn't have got her to where she's got today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a balance of being there to help help her push herself, yeah. but also being encouraging so she's not yes. discouraged. Yes. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, hopefully. And again, that's something I now take from my father because I didn't get that. Mm. I guess that has made me realize that I need to do it, but I need to do it with a limited, uh, in a limited amount compared to what we feel that we should, just so that she keeps her own drive. Right, right. What a beautiful lesson to, to teach her. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so just a couple of more questions. So you gave me this wonderful booklet that you had put together before you moved to Melbourne. You needed to put together a booklet about your company yes. and all these these uh, referrals and reference letters, et cetera. And you allowed me to read through it, which was very fascinating. 
but I came across one of the letters of references, and I know you haven't read this in a long time, I so I will read this to you, and I thought it was really beautiful, and I think uh, it will be a lovely reminder to you of who you are. I remember the time when father and son, Richard, began to work together, and Richard could not have bettered the expertise that over the years his father passed on to him. This would have been a waste of time had not Richard been a natural talent, a chip off the old block, as the old saying goes. I never have any worries when I give a difficult job to the smarts. I know that if the job is impossible to restore, that they have the honesty to tell you and will tell you what they can do about it. It will not be a good day for me, and I am sure all of their customers, when it comes time for Richard to leave our shores, it can only be a gain for whoever. Yours faithfully, PGHK. So lovely. Thank you. Thank you for reading that. And my final question that I ask everybody, with what you do, what is it that you want to leave behind in the world? Ooh. Um, difficult question, really. Um, I think about leaving thing, uh, something behind in my world is, is, especially right now, is just about my daughter rather than my career and craft. Um, so leaving her in a, in a wonderful place, which she's already getting herself to, I think is, is my ultimate goal today. Um, however, as far as the business and craft is concerned, I'm often finding books with uh, comments in them or gold stamps saying bound for um, Zangorski and Sutcliffe or bound for, bound for, sorry, E. Joseph's, a book dealer that would have been around at the time. I'm looking forward to, in a hundred years, people opening books and saying that I had bound that for one of my customers or a note in that book saying, well, that came from EC Rare Books. Mm, so beautiful. I'm so glad that I met you. I have learned so much in the times that I have spent with you, which have been a handful, but I'm sure will be many more. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for doing what you do for being a guardian of history. And everybody, please go visit him at his shop. Uh, what's the address again? I know it's under Revolver, but yeah. maybe the address would be really good. 323 Camby. Go see Richard, 323 Camby. Thank you for your time. Thank I you appreciate so much. It. If you enjoyed that last conversation, be sure to check out more episodes with Craft on Spotify and guest photo galleries on the website at wearethecraft.com. Thanks again for listening. <laughs>